Well, good morning. Good morning, Sydney. How are you doing? I'm doing as well as can be under under all the circumstances. How about you? Yeah, it's been surreal, crazy, difficult times. Um, but we're I think we're we're getting getting hopefully to a place you can see light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I was just reflecting this morning before I get into the interview that um, it's been a, maybe 12, 13 years since um, we first met and you came down to Santa Barbara to help review a concept called Fossil Free by 33. Um, and we were in a yurt in a, a, up the Gaviota Coast. At I remember Cafe. it. <laughs> and it's it like, like glamping. Glamping, yeah. yeah. It was like a lifetime ago. Um, yeah. And here we are, you know, 12, 13 years later into the fossil fuel story, and so much has happened, um, a lot to unpack there. And quite interesting and timely that we're having this discussion um, the day after the price of oil dropped to zero or less than zero, which is just kind of a moment we would not have, uh, I wouldn't have seen coming. I know, I mean, yeah, the state has a goal. Many other states, I think there's 11 or 12 now have goals of getting to zero carbon energy ours is by 2045 i mean the 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 cool thing is like it was just an idea at the time and it seemed so radical and no one could believe that we had the audacity to even be discussing it let alone proposing it um and then folks at stanford you know five years ago were really like we can actually do this why well, set a goal of 50 percent or 60 percent? we need to get to 100 percent. so it shows the power of ideas to to push stuff forward and and also who I remember Amory Lovins I think we even talked about it at the time was like the stone age didn't end by running out of stones and the oil age is not going to run out of oil and so the question is I, I mean bizarrely the price of oil being at zero means that many destructive oil extraction practices become unaffordable like tar sands you can't you can't extract oil from tar for less than like $45 a barrel. So when it's, I think yesterday, the futures market was actually negative 40 for a point. Like you would have to pay someone, Sigrid, to take the oil off your hands because um, there's no storage capacity. So who knew that the cheaper the price got, potentially the more we can um, institute zero carbon policies. Yeah, it's such a, such a poignant and interesting time. It just feels like we're living the metaphors, right? We're just yeah. living, everything has become, is becoming actualized. And, and you know, I want to start with one of kind of the first symbols or images of the environmental movement, um, or some of the first, and in Santa Barbara, speaking of oil, that was the 1969 oil spill. Um, you know, as you and I are kind of part of the, the next generation of environmental activists that came out of that wave, so we really rely on the stories of our elders to tell us what was, what was the impetus and the energy of the 60s that led to Earth Day. And, you know, as I mentioned in Santa Barbara, our elders talk about the oil spill and that the grief and the anger of that, that, that came out of that. But many in my circle also talk about um, that Earthrise photo that was taken from the Apollo 8 mission and how that shifted their world uh, view and, and their view of themselves. Because it really turned out that um, during that exploration, the real message from that mission was when the explorers turned around and looked back at ourselves and, and realized our interconnection and our humanity and our dependence on one another. I'm just curious, like what, um, you know, what stories from your elders um, resonated with you growing up about the birth of the environmental movement? Um, well, I, I don't, I mean, I'll tell you my age. So I was born in September, 1969. So I was born between July 4th when, you know, the man landed on the moon and April 22nd, 1970, which was the first Earth Day. So, I mean, I, I always tease that, you know, my brother who was born before, like has no idea how to do technology, but because I was born after the man lands on, landed on the moon, I kind of have some idea. Um, I mean, for me, it, it really has more to do, like I grew up with the mythology of Joseph Campbell and kind of thinking through the deep connections that we've had with Earth during our entire evolution. Um, and really this concept that we were born from the Big Bang mm -hmm. and 
scientific, you know, scientifically, we, we kind of can conceptualize what that means, that there was this infinitesimally dense atom before which there was no space or time. So if you think about that, you know, that there was this atom that created every single thing in the known universe, it just shows that we're kind of all made of stardust um, and that we're all connected, like the table, the computer, us. And the more that I get involved in the environmental movement, um, especially things like the microbial loading in our bodies, you know, more than half the genetic material in us is foreign to us. We are not born with. It's microbes that come from the world around us. And so we are, I think we've developed this level of belief in our independence mm -hmm. with technology since the birth of, of the environmental movement that's really dangerous. It, it kind of gives us a sense of comfort and security and ability to not need each other, not need the natural world, somehow that we're better than the rest of the natural world and nature. Um, so I don't know, I think it's recreating a mythology for the next 50 years based on based on our interconnection um so the more i the more i think about it the more kind of connection between spirituality religion the environmental movement you know and science needs to be the future because the past has been just overly reliant on especially the most recent past on we can do it alone where where technology and money and owning stuff is going to help us get where we need to go, whereas it probably won't. And so timely. Wow, we went deep real fast on that first yeah. question, and thank you, because that's exactly how I feel and how I think about it. And um, it's so, it really resonates right now, right? Because we're in this moment in time where we um, also have to turn around, go home, and we're focusing and we're realizing the, the importance of our interdependence, that we're really relying on each other. We're all connected and re relying on each other to maintain public health, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, and that planetary health, you know, the Harvard study about how air pollution exacerbates the, your lack of tolerance to COVID-19, like there are all these other stresses that disadvantage and other communities are suffering more because of predisposition, because of all these environmental stresses that exist in their communities. And it's not just one thing or the other, there's a lot, a lot at play. Absolutely, and yet the flip side of that too is kind of one of the striking results of what we're going through, this kind of rolling shutdown of businesses, is that significant reduction in air, land, and, and water pollution, and even noise pollution. Um, so it feels to me like we're kind of getting this real-time look at the burden that we impose on the planet during normal times. Um, it's almost like, you know, virtual reality without the virtual reality headset, right? Um, yeah, it's surreal. So, uh, yeah, and obviously that economic shutdown in and of, of itself is kind of a natural disaster and we cannot maintain that and we need to find our way to navigate um, our way through that very quickly. But I'm really interested, and I'm personally interested in helping myself and others kind of retain the memory of the few positives of this situation, mm -hmm. including that short break from hyper-consumerism. So I'm just curious as how you think we can use this time to kind of mine for, mine for those gems that we can carry forward. I mean, one of them, Sigrid, is, is most obviously, you know, I think working in a large organization, there's this reticence across the board to let people work from home, to have that flexibility. And with house prices, going up, people live further and further from where they work. And right now, 93, 94% of our workforce at Cal EPA, so of the you know 6,200 people, 92% of them are working at home and they're doing a great job. And I think managers, you know, part of that memory of what's happened is like, it actually works. You actually can work at home. Um, not all Jobs are created equal, and so there's also issues of inequality around who can and can't work at home. But for those who can, allowing them to work at home so that the streets are empty for those who actually need to get to work, you know, those kind of things I think are really important. Mm -hmm. um, others, you know, to me, you just mentioned one of them, which is I'm in Sacramento. I live under the flight path of the Sacramento airport. It's been blissful, like one of the more innovative things that we don't think about is noise pollution right. 
um, and just our tolerance for it has increased. But when it's gone, it's like, wow, this is incredible. Um, and our ability for self-reflection, I think, you know, we don't have a lot of time normally. Now we have lots of time to contemplate and think. Um, and I miss that. I, I realize how much I'd miss that. Um, and just simple things, as you pointed out, like we can get by with a lot less than we thought. Um, and really goes back to kind of the original question, which is of all the things that are worth celebrating on Earth Day, life itself seems to be the most important. Like that, that's what we're fighting for now is, is a chance at living life to its fullest. And when it's taken away by COVID-19, by the pandemic, you know, we, we have time to reflect on what that means, but it also means we have to take full advantage while we can of the precious days we have on the planet. And our own mortality seems like the last taboo subject, you know, in, in the United States, if you go to Mexico or India or many other places, people talk about mortality, but we hold that very close to us. And so that's another result of like, how do we think about intergenerational equity? How do we think about what it means to be alive right now? So yeah, a lot going on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and of course, you know, not everyone is experiencing the kind of the luxury of time to think and <laughs> during all of this, and there's, a, you know, there are a lot of um, kind of components, including some justice components that I want to dig into here in a second. But one of the things that really struck me today is um, that the, uh, one of the key pieces of legislation that emerged from this era that we're talking about 50 years ago was the Clean Air Act, which is also marking its 50th anniversary this year. And um, the American Lung Association put out their um, state of the air report today, which tracks data through 2018. So it doesn't, it doesn't get 2019 and 2020 and doesn't get this time period when we're in right now. Um, but, you know, I'm struck by how five of the, the, top cities with the worst air pollution in the U.S. are in California, Los Angeles, Bakersfield, Fresno, and so forth. And even Santa Barbara and Santa Maria were seeing an uptick during that time period, worst ever air qualities in terms of particle pollution in the history of that report. So some of that had to do with data coming from um, those being the hottest years on record that we had and climate-driven wildfires. But it really seems timely to me to be talking about air quality right now with so many intersecting themes. I know you're dealing with many of them, the Trump administration's um, trying to roll back vehicle efficiency standards, the increase in climate related fires. Um, and then to, to my point earlier, uh, how it appears um, that COVID-19's impacts more seriously affect community populations that are already dealing with poor air quality. So I'm just, curious as to what's your greatest concern in all of that um you focused i mean i think you hit the nail on the head Sigrid, which is covid19 is just exposing huge disparities um, and inequality in our society that are there um and as you said if you're living with seven of your family members in a 500 square foot trailer that's very different than being having the luxury of being in a single family home and you know and, and so there are huge disparities also you know when we think about essential workers who's having to go to the fields to pick the food so that we can eat who's working in the grocery stores and gas stations and pharmacies um it's a lot of communities of color and low-income communities that are still commuting that still have issues very real issues right now and, and often are not getting the worker protection that they need. So that, that's a big focus right now of ours is, is really making sure that we spend time looking at how to solve some of those issues. Um, in terms of air pollution, there's been huge gains over the last 50 years since Earth Day. Um, if you think about LA and the smog um, and then the invention of the catalytic converter and you know, all those gains are real. At the same time, when you look at where we're failing in terms of meeting our greenhouse gas reduction targets, it's all in the transportation sector. Um, and diesel particulate matter, um, which we know is a carcinogen, um, continues to plague communities that live along 
the side of transit corridors that live um, by freight hubs like ports and locomotive yards, and mainly, mainly those are disadvantaged communities. So this intersection between public health and vulnerability and where the emissions still are is huge. And I don't think it was kind of given enough attention back in 1970. I don't think the science wasn't there. You know, what we've seen is the air has gotten cleaner and cleaner, but the science has shown us that more and sorry, I don't know if you heard that, but there was like a big thing. So the science has shown us that um, that we really at small quantities of things like PM 2.5, which is very, very fine micrograms of particulate matter, you'd think, oh, they, they have issues with the lungs, but really it's actually issues with the heart. Um, it's, it's blocking the passageways to the heart and causing heart attacks and, and premature deaths in California, very large scale. Last year, I think it was between eight and 12,000 people died prematurely from air pollution. Mm -hmm. And most of those were communities of color and low income communities. We have the highest asthma rates in the nation in places like Fresno. So um, we got a long way to go is the point. You know, we, we can look back and see the gains that we've made. Um, and I would say, you know, some of the, both the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, and the Clean Air Act are probably, if you look at public health gains over the last 50 years, probably the most successful public health laws in our country. Um, by, by dealing with those issues, we've really reduced mortality in many, many areas. As you pointed out, we are defending ourselves against significant attacks from the Trump administration. Um, we're not looking for this fight, but we're certainly going to defend ourselves. Today, we're issuing a lawsuit um, to protect endangered species in California um, to make sure that the pumping operations of water from Northern California to Southern California don't endanger fish species. Um, and we're already seeing impacts of the federal government's action. So, um, you know, to, as you mentioned on clean cars, the auto, um, the, the American automobile um, manufacturers came together with President Obama and came out with a deal that Trump has reneged on. Um, and so we'll be taking litigation action on that. I think we're now at 45 lawsuits um, that California has brought against the Trump administration. I don't think we've lost any to date. Um, but it's unfortunate that of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, we're still having these questions that were once bipartisan issues of concern. And to me, they still are. Everyone breathes the same air, drinks the same water. Um, we, should, we should really work, I think, in the next 50 years to make sure that people look back and say, wow, it was so weird in 2020 how this was a partisan issue. Thank God, you know, in 2070, it's an issue where people have come together again. Absolutely. Um, it really calls to mind to me as well the importance of having strong states like California, right? We, we cast a pretty big shadow globally. We're the fifth largest economy in the world. Um, you know, I know lately there's been quite a debate about the term nation states, but even before that, I was recently reading Rahm Emanuel's new book about city states. Um, and it got, or nation cities, excuse me, and it got me really thinking about um, the power that communities can have, particularly in a time like now when we are not seeing leadership um, on climate and environmental issues from the national, from the federal government. So just for, from your perspective, what cities or counties in California do you really see um, with a truly visionary agenda, ones that we, we in Santa Barbara might turn to or look at as we push our leaders to think bigger? Well, just at the initial point, Sigrid, I mean, I, I just have to agree. I mean, since the birth of our nation, and if you look around the world, ideas have come from localities and states. I think we, we have this idea that somehow they, they just bubble up and end up turning into legislation in D.C. But the Clean Air Act is a great example. The reason that California has authority under the federal Clean Air Act is because we already had one in 1965 way before the federal government and Californians in, in LA in particular were pushing for, for solving air pollution issues. Um, California, you know, if you look across the, the big issues um, of how we reduce toxicity, how we build a circular economy, 
you know, how we focus on things like basic science at the UCs and the incredible work happening across all of California. Um, when you look at transportation and climate planning, land use planning, how we think about environmental justice. I mean, literally, you know, there, there are cities like Fresno that have a 74% recycling rate, which is higher than nearly any place in the country. Um, there's, there's projects that relate to drip irrigation and, you know, farmers that are on the cutting edge and people from around the world are going to the Central Valley to look at how we're doing farming. Santa Barbara now, bizarrely, has like the most cannabis permits of any county in the nation. So, you, you know, water is a big issue. Pesticides are a big issue to, to think about, which you probably weren't thinking about. Um, you know, how we work with our sovereign tribal nations, um, like the Santa Ynez Chumash um, in Santa Barbara, they're, they're actually, I would say, one of the greenest, most climate conscious um, tribes in the nation. Um, our ocean policies, um, San, you know, both Santa Barbara, Santa Cruz, Monterey, San Francisco are looking at with a lot of focus how we reduce marine pollution into the oceans. And certainly the Brent School um, at UC Santa Barbara is leading the world in looking at how much trash is going into the oceans. Um, LA, I think, set a goal. Uh, Mayor Garcetti recently set this goal of having no ocean discharges from wastewater treatment plants, so billions of gallons of water that are currently going into the Pacific. How do we reuse those? How do we recycle those? His goal is to end that by 2035. Um, same is true, you know, Republican um, mayor of Santa Barbara, Mayor Faulkner, his pure water campaign to really look at how San, San Diego reduces the amount of water coming from the Colorado and thinking of innovative solutions of water conservation. Um, all the way through San Francisco, if you look at their integrated pest management, how much pesticides they've reduced um, in their city, it's incredible. Um, and, you know, issues of recycling um, are vexing at this time because we're, we're going through, you know, global kind of complications relating to export bans and all kinds of different stuff. But communities around you know, um, in Alameda County, Berkeley and others are really stepping up their game and looking at how to change the paradigm. So for me, um, across the board, cities in California are inspiring me. Um, we had a meeting with this group, Green Cities California recently, and I was just blown away at how much is happening at the local level, um, how all of them are saying, how do we build out um, infrastructure for electric vehicles. So electric vehicle charging is only going to happen at the local level. We're going to help, we're going to provide money, but the, the land use planning, the zoning, the getting it in is, is local government, as, as with energy efficiency and solar. So I, everywhere I go in the state, I'm inspired, whether it's rural California, um, yeah. The final thing I'd say in rural California is people are really looking at on-farm co composting and how we use that compost to apply it to the land to sequester carbon, um, which I think is the next frontier. Yeah, what I loved about your reply there was it was a, an intermix of small and large cities, rural areas, um, and, and some of the usual suspects, right, Berkeley, but some that you wouldn't really think about, like Fresno. And that speaks to, I think, the, the level of innovation and communication that's taking place and that we can all learn from each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, just curious, what's on your post-COVID pandemic policy wish list? I don't, um, I think it, there, my sense of, of where we are is that we're not going to return to normal. It isn't going to look like before. Um, so to your earlier point, how do we maintain some of the gains that we've achieved? How do we get to a place that looks environmentally more like where we are now with reduced emissions, um, reduced pollution, um, communities coming together? How do we achieve that? So the governor created this economic recovery task force um, that I have the honor of sitting on. And I think that that's one of the things we're looking at. How do we have a greener, more inclusive, more equitable future for California springboarding from where we are? So some of the things that we talked about in our budget in January um, aren't going to happen. 
that just would you know the fiscal realities are going to be very stark for government we're going to have to prioritize um which i think is going to be a painful and at the same time useful exercise um so really those things like equity i think if, if we have a recovery that leads to the same inequalities or the same level of pollution um we all have missed a big opportunity yeah yeah really good last question for you um so one of the things i really appreciate you is just uh, about you is your adventurous spirit um and how you just balance the heaviness of the work that you do with getting out into nature and in fact a couple of years ago you took a break between your epa gigs to hike the pacific crest trail and i know you still do as much hiking and trail trail walking as you can um you continue to do your pod ship earth podcast which i seems to me like a way that you stay connected um, with other interesting minds and adventurers but you talk about the importance of getting lost and can you just speak to why that's important to you and how that might be particularly relevant today as we navigate new and unprecedented challenges yeah i think we you know sigrid we we have a phone that kind of dictates everything that we do and we don't really we don't have paper maps anymore before we go on a journey we don't look at where we're going we we just plug it in and blindly listen while siri tells us what streets to turn on so just the whole experience of getting lost i think is almost like a bygone era like it's really hard to get lost um and so that that idea of not knowing where you're going fills people with dread mm -hmm. um and rather than for me you, you know when i am lost um hiking and i went on after i did the pacific crest trail i did a section of the continental divide trail with my cousin um and the continental divide trail has no marking our maps were terrible and we got lost probably six or seven times a day and it was so frustrating i mean it's just like wow how could we be this far from where we thought so the first interesting concept and he was my cousin was in was a uh a paratrooper he was like which i love this concept of like bending the map so he was like jared you know we we want the map to conform with where we think we are and so we we need to really look at where we are more carefully so that's the first thing about not getting lost or understanding when you are lost where the hell are you um how do you get your bearings and then the other part was just it's kind of a freedom to to be in this place where you get to not know where you are but know where you want to go and understand how to navigate um so it's um yeah we are in some ways i think afraid of saying that we're lost um the minute you know that you're lost you can either go back to where you last know you were that makes you feel secure or you can chart a different course but sometimes i think we are lost and we just don't acknowledge it so the hiking metaphor is really like how how we go to where we want to get to how we be comfortable with just being where we are and enjoying it which is kind of where we got to on this hike which is you get lost you get frustrated and then you sit down and you're like wow this is incredibly beautiful look at this river look at these trees like rather than focusing on being lost focusing on where you are at that moment and um being grateful for it I've ended on a better metaphor. We started with good me good metaphors. We ended on a great one that feels very relevant to the moment in time. Just taking a breath and looking at um, where we are, acknowledging that we are maybe a little feeling a little bit lost and feeling gratitude for pieces of it, and um, knowing that we're going to find our way out. So thank you, Jared. I always really enjoy you, talking with you. You've got a great brain. No, it's really fun. And happy Earth Day. Yes, thank you. All right. Okay. Take care. Thanks, Iris. Okay, bye.